Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, I did a quick count late yesterday. We have a total of um, 47 members, which is great, um, many of which are here today. Um, we've also, as many of you have seen, and as you're becoming, you know, adding to the uh, email list, we do a lot of uh, communication in between sessions, in between our on-site sessions, which is really a real helpful thing for me, selfishly, in a lot of ways, because I see a lot of good information in, uh, information sharing, um, in addition to the actual on-site sessions we have here. Um, the session format for today um, is a little bit different than what our typical, um, you know, quarterly sessions will be. It's the kickoff, obviously. It's um, looking ahead to a fourth year. But we really wanted to um, add some um, more structured format content for this particular session. So I'm really excited. Uh, we have um, a few presentations um, that we're going to go through. And um, the first is uh, entitled Changing Your Game, the Experience from the Orchards, uh, Orchards uh, Children's Services. And uh, Bob Blumenfeld uh, will be uh, speaking in just a minute with, uh, on that. We also have a benefits benchmarking um, project uh, that Heather uh, Simet from Coabit Pottery um, is, um, has kicked off, and um, so she was going to go over that uh, with the group for a few minutes. And also, um, Jane is going to speak to the Cultural Alliance um, Financial Services System um, and some other things going on with the Cultural Alliance for the group. So thanks uh, to everybody for that. And then at the close of the session today, we will carve out uh, some time just for some give and take, um, you know, maybe planning for the next session. We're looking probably to a January, a late January session, and we'll talk about some possible dates there that I can confirm later. And um, really, any of you that have been involved in the sessions in the past know that uh, typically um, it's a very kind of informal, conversational type of a program. Um, we typically try to tackle one or two um, issues, challenges, um, just simple from the simple to the complicated uh, in terms of what we're dealing with and what we're trying to, um, to take the next step on as an organization from a financial person's perspective. So um, we'll do a little bit of that today, but then maybe set the stage for um, some topics in the future. So um, you probably also have the program summary that was on the table, just if you want to get a little bit more background if you haven't received that already. And um, you know, basically it's kind of a free-flowing um, discussion group for the most part. Uh, but uh, I would like to um, kick things off here with uh, Bob uh, and uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. So originally it was supposed to be changing your game and as I started to sort of do stuff, I realized that the game itself had changed a little bit. And I kind of started to reflect on that. And so I know we've got a lot of finance people, but if we can sort of like round up a little bit, let's think back to like 1492 when Columbus came to the US, we wrote a 1500. All right, now it's 2011, almost 12, let's round down and go to 2000. So over the course of 500 years, a few things have changed. And 500 years isn't a real long time, right, in the grand scheme of things. So we can narrow that down and maybe talk about what's changed over the last 20 years. Anything different for folks or 10 years, however long? Anybody want to share some things that maybe they didn't experience in terms of the nonprofit sector and your role in it? Everything's the same as it was? <laughs> or is it a where do I begin? Yeah. Well, anybody want to offer like one thing? Money Please. is harder to find. Money is harder to find. Okay, fair enough. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Um, anything else? How about how we communicate? Anything different there? Anybody feeling a little information overload? Raise your hand. All right. So all those things kind of come into play. Um, so just kind of going through this a little bit, let's talk about the environment that we work in, right? It used to be that things were really sort of manual. And I, I liked this analogy as I was kind of going through things. Like, we used to have board games that you'd play, Monopoly, right? I might be dating myself here a little bit. Um, and then things kind of, I remember, anybody remember like Space Invaders? Right, and you would have to go to the arcade and put like 25 cents in, or, and then you'd stand there and play, and then you'd have to go get more quarters. And now you can pretty much walk around and play whatever game you want. 
with somebody like halfway across the globe, right? So all that stuff kind of ties in. Um, for us as finance people, uh, the analogy that I came up with was we used to have pegboards, and then we went to desktops, and now we're sort of working in a cloud, right? And hopefully not a fog. Um, so for orchards, a couple of things happened. Um, we had a lot of growth. Uh, and Orchards is, just to put things in context today, about a $14 million company, so we're, we're relatively large, I guess. Um, we're human services oriented, so I'm going to try and hear at least some of what I say to a lot of the folks that are here from the Cultural Alliance. Um, but I don't know that things are really dramatically different. Uh, the sector as a whole is struggling in terms of dollars and where they get dollars. Uh, I think there's a lot of new challenges around governance, right? If any folks have done their 990s back to 2008, some different stuff there. And different expectations for the board in helping to complete those forms, right? Bob and I uh, are, are, are involved with another organization, and we were kind of like ruminating, lamenting, chuckling this morning about just the volume of information that's flowing around the filing of a 990 that's due on November 15th how much dialogue there is among board members. And that's really actually kind of good. It means that people are sort of being forced to be more engaged around pretty significant issues. Um, for Orchards, what's happened is that as we've experienced that decline in government dollars, we've really had to step up our game on a couple of key fronts, and it relates to that money issue. Um, one is advocacy. So we spent a lot of time where we didn't used to have to, we spend a lot of time talking to uh, legislators and trying to get our case in front of the people who are making decisions at a policy level. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of, uh, of editorial latitude here and, and also suggest that maybe socially, do you think socially some of our priorities have changed too? Or are we where we always were? But maybe if you had to pick a couple of things, what would be would be something, a unique sort of dialogue that's going on now relative to social issues. How about the economy and what the social impact is of immigrants? Is that a positive or a negative impact? And I bet the answer to that question depends on who you talk to. If you talk to Steve Tabachman, anybody know Steve Tabachman? He's really involved in an initiative right now to help folks appreciate the value of what immigrant populations bring to our country and to us in this country. I think if you talk to some other people, they might have a different take on that. Right. Any other social issues that are challenging? Uh, I know there's a lot of folks here from the Cultural Alliance. Any folks here who serve on organizations that serve youth? <coughs> Okay, I'll raise my hand too. A few of us. Somebody mentioned something to me, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me because I'm sort of like moving up the, the age ladder myself. But it's really probably likely that over the course of the next 10 or 20 years, there's going to be a significant tension that begins to bubble up between youth serving organizations and organizations serving who? Right. Right? And now, you know, at least. From my vantage point, maybe self-interested, being in a youth-serving organization, people who already struggle to have a voice are going to be drowned out maybe by even louder voices. And again, this isn't a right or a wrong or a good or a bad, but when we start to look at the landscape and how we can serve our organizations, I think those are things that we need to kind of consider because they're going to affect things at the bottom line. Um, I put this up only to kind of demonstrate that over the course of not so many years, we actually had to significantly increase our capacity. And part of that relates to other things that I want to talk about um, as we go forward here. So I was going to have like a bunch of stuff up here, but I don't even know what the rules are. Because the rules used to be, right, we get government funding and we pay our folks a reasonable wage. And maybe we do a little fundraising. And, and then we'd be okay, and we'd make a little bit of money at the end. And it's definitely, that's not the rules for us anymore. Anybody else have any rules that changed for them? I just want to say a big change is now we have to be a lot 
more external aware than we did before, where before we were concerned about and still far about what's happening inside our organization, especially in finance, we focus inside. Now you have to really watch what's happening outside your organization almost just as much to try to anticipate the financial impact of those things that are happening outside of the organization. Absolutely. I think that's a great comment. And again, I'll just elaborate on that. Like We used to bid competitively. We would win a bid, we would get funding, and then we could move on. But now, the competitive environment is much more intense. The regulation of our industry is much more intense. And maybe from the cultural alliance um, vantage point, have, have, have you struggled in terms of where what you do you perceive as being valued in the community? Or do you feel like people do value what you do, typically? Please. I think that um, <coughs> people value what we do. I think we're having to you know, make that case more vocally than maybe we did in the past, as, as every sector of the nonprofit does. I think one of the financial impacts is that there is really almost no significant, anyway, no um, public funding at all um, for the arts. So I think that that is a game changer in terms of how you have to engage your individual supporters and your foundation supporters. Great feedback, yes. Hi, I'm Heather Sennett, and um, I'm from Quabbit Pottery. We've been told by several branchers over the last fiscal year that they've changed their granting um, strategies, which no longer serve the arts community. So we had several large grants in our budget that we had received over several years, and Basically, they change from arts um, and cultural organizations to basic, basic needs. And we've really... So the rules changed. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. And I, I probably wove in a little bit of my own issues with, with that, because my I, I have a, a daughter who's very engaged in creative processes mm -hmm. and laments the STEM app. Right? She's like, I know people have to get jobs, and science, technology, engineering, and math is where it's at, but darn it. Being creative counts too. So that's I was kind of put my own secret message in there. Now I'm out of Yes, ma'am. And um, actually, you know, we, we try to reach out to uh, underserved population and they um, in general they're they're just concerned about their basic needs. It ties right into what she's saying about the the grant requirements or what they're looking forward to to support. And and I think our our, our job right now is to, to um, educate people as to the need for uh, what we do. That it is a need and not just something that's just nice to have. Sure. So absolutely you know, have to convince them that it's needed for their lives. Another thing that my boss likes to sort of talk about a little bit um, is uh, there's a lot of efforts in the grant making arena around outcomes and proving outcomes, right? And his his analogy is if Martin Luther King had to go through that process, we might have never had a civil rights. Right? If you if you said to somebody, you have to prove what the outcome is going to be before they were even able to test it, that is a little bit of a, a barrier, and particularly when you start talking about esoteric things like arts and culture and literacy and reading and literacy maybe kind of moves over into the educational arena, so I think that's got some, maybe some traction, but some of the other things, I, I can appreciate some of the challenges that you're having. Um, I do think that there may be some value that we can add as finance folks, though, to that conversation. How do you sort of quantify that? And maybe start to explore like what the changes are that people experience. And we are, you know, maybe as a, as a, a stereotype or a generalization, probably a lot of us are STEM people. Right? We can help sort of put those those processes together to sort of empirically evaluate the value of what it is that we do, whether it's arts and culture or serving youth or whatever our particular land concerns is. Right? <clears throat> so there may be opportunities there for us to contribute in ways that we had. Um, so a little bit about uh, sort of the team and the folks that are helping to provide the services. Anything change there? Or things pretty much the way they always were. Is there a lot of less capital? Okay. Too small. Okay. Too 
Okay, so smaller teams. What about um, things like diversity? Meaning different people, different cultures, different backgrounds, different neighborhoods, different genders, different sexual orientations. And that kind of influences how folks work. And again, I guess I would advocate that it influences things in a positive way. But other people might not sense that or might struggle with that. Right? Have folks here, have, have organizations that are represented here, have, have many or any of you had any sort of like cultural diversity training, formal training? And, and there's real value to that, because sometimes people who maybe themselves come from more homogeneous backgrounds and environments and experiences may not appreciate the value or understand how to tap into the value of some of their colleagues. Right? So there, there may be opportunities there. Another thing, uh, again, for us has been, and it kind of goes back to that outcomes versus outputs type thing, we've really moved in the youth serving area from a, an approach that talks about intervention to one that talks about prevention, like trying to get ahead of the curve. And you see that a lot in education, too. That early childhood development piece really has taken on, uh, I think, a, a life of its own, and, and there's lots of data to support doing that if you can get to kids early then it has a much more dramatic impact than if you get to them later in their educational career or their maturation process. Hey Bob, why don't you um, give, because not everybody might, um, everyone might not know exactly what the services of orchards are, what you oh, do. Oh, you know what, yeah, I didn't do a very good job of introducing myself. I apologize, thank yeah. you, Bob. Um, so, orchards, uh, I mentioned, is about $14 million. Um, we provide services around abuse and neglect to kids and families, um, from birth to young adulthood. Uh, we've got offices in five counties. Our headquarters are in Southfield, and then we're in Detroit, Flint, Sterling Heights, and Ann Arbor. Um, we serve about 600 kids in our foster care caseload and about 2,400 families across our footprint in prevention services and what we call family preservation. About 94% of our revenue comes from the State of Michigan Department of Human Services, and it used to be 98%. And our revenue has gone over the last five years from about $8 million to about $14 million. So we've actually been kind of an up, on an upswing. Um, and there's, there's, uh, there's a reason for that. In addition to the fact that we're really good at what we do, and we, we actually are, I mean, this isn't necessarily a commercial for orchards, but uh, we are sort of seen as the benchmark in foster care and adoption services. And our family preservation programs this year actually became the largest component of our agency, where for, uh, I came in 2002. From 2002 to 2007, we lost over a million dollars. And I had the dubious distinction of being the only financial leader in the organization's history to never show a profit as of 2007. Uh, I'm only willing to share that with you because over the last five years, we've much more than made up for that. And part of that had to do with a team coming together and understanding what the financial implications were of things that in the past maybe had been fully vetted and, and discussed. And, 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 and I had to, the finance folks had to, develop a different appreciation for how we could help on the program side. What kind of value could we have? We'll talk some more about that. But that's, uh, I appreciate you saying that. That's a little context. Um, okay, I also, um, I don't know if folks know who Josh Linkner is. Right, so he's partners with Dan Gilbert. He's a creative sort, um, and I think that he was the, the founder or the creator of E-Prize. Um, and he's got a great blog. If you have a chance to sort of tap into his blog, and I'm not like a huge blog guy, but he, for whatever reason, his messages resonate with me. And he does a lot of sort of before and afters, and he talks about things in sort of a, a spiritually connected way, not a religiously spiritually, but sort of like a people connection type way. And he's got a, a blog, and it talks about how things have changed it, it, uh, over the course of time. And a couple of things that he mentioned was where we talk about the team, like it used to be that the driving force was control, right? And now it's empowerment. And it used to be that everybody wanted to be big, and now everybody wants to be fast. And I think that those points of context really resonate. He's got like a list of them I didn't memorize while we're writing down. Um, but those two things were really important for me as a finance person because I do think that, again, I tend to be a controlling person. I want everything in rows and columns. I want to be able to get a number when I'm done you know, with the calculation. I need some certainty. 
And it's really helped me uh, over the course of time to sort of get into maybe a little bit of a discomfort zone instead of a comfort zone, to be able to sort of look out, you know, to Carl's point earlier, look out into the environment, try and anticipate things that might not be readily apparent, but I can't get my, my, my hands around, my arms around, my mind around. But if I can maybe put some context to things and listen a lot to what other people are saying, uh, it has helped me develop models that concretize some of those, those variables. Hopefully that, that helps. Um, when we talk about the team also, uh, again, just to demonstrate some Orchard's growth over time, growth is great, but we've done it very incrementally. We've done it very thoughtfully. It hasn't been like, we're going to go from here to here. It's been just a gradual increase. And the other thing that I think was we, we did really good, you know, have myself on the back and my team a little bit, I, I think that we never really had a lot of mission. We didn't say, we need to get more money, so we're going to go over here and do this, if it didn't really fit with our model. We sort of read the tea leaves a little bit, kept our finger on the pulse of what was going on in the environment. And it's been, I think, just organically at Orchards, uh, 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 a tendency that we've had. So back in the 80s, uh, our former CEO, a guy named Jerry Levin, Orchards started as a residential services provider. Anybody familiar with what's going on in residential services across the nation? I mean, forget about just Michigan. Okay, residential services is sort of like the, the least favored option in terms of how children are served. And residential means a child would come and live in a relatively large institutional facility and not have a lot of family contact. A lot of peer contact, but not a lot of family contact. That is absolutely on a policy level, not a favored option in terms of serving kids. Well, that used to be like almost the model, right? So you have these really large institutions who are closing. Uh, St. Vincent Sarah Fisher Center in Farmington Hills, right there on, what is it, 13 and 12 and, and Angster, shut down. Huge <coughs> campus. And the list kind of, uh, I don't know if folks are familiar, Lutheran Child and Family Services is getting ready to merge with Lutheran Home and Aging Services. So you're going to see that kind of consolidation in that arena. Orchards in the 80s was a residential services provider. And I'm not sure what tea leaves they were reading, but at some point in time they said, the future of child welfare is going to be in community-based services in foster care and adoption and keeping kids with family preservation, keeping kids connected to their families, their communities, and their schools. And they shut down all their residential facilities and they went entirely community-based. So that has really helped us weather some significant storms that some of our peers are challenged with. Some of that might be really good thinking, some of it might just be really good luck, right? Like I'm not gonna take too much credit, and I wasn't here when that decision was made. I'm not gonna take any credit, but I think luck sometimes helps a little bit too, right? My dad would just say I'd rather be lucky than smart. So. Um, and he was a pretty smart guy too. Um, so just kind of putting all those things in context, I think the more, again, to Carl's point, we can keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on out there, kind of listen to what, what's going on at a policy level, and then start to craft solutions to how we can get our message out and, and, and help to foster appreciation in other people of the value that we bring to the community. Um, it's a competitive labor market, so a couple of things that we've done uh, relative to the team is we have quarterly staff meetings. And I gotta tell you, that isn't like something that we have the luxury of doing. I mean, we have to commit to doing it. But having the senior leadership in the organization go out and talk to people has been a huge game changer in terms of keeping people connected. We are not the best paying organization. There are people who pay significantly better than we do. Um, but we have one of the best organizational cultures. And from a financial vantage point, that has huge value because we get to pay a little bit of a discount while still remaining committed, we get to recognize people in ways that other people don't. And ultimately, um, we get a little bit of, of flux on the upside. So if you look at our compensation, we've been consistently able to increase that over time, where other organizations who may be paying more have actually had to cut. Psychologically, I think there's some value on both, both fronts. Um, we also have a suggestion feedback loop. So if somebody makes a suggestion, we tell them what happened with it, right? We don't always agree, we don't always promote that particular suggestion, but we are absolutely committed 
to making sure that if somebody makes a suggestion, we let them know what the outcome is. So that they don't feel like, oh great, they got a suggestion box and it goes into the void and I never hear anything. Uh, we use technology a lot. So we've, every employee that we have has access to a netbooks to a laptop, which makes them much more functional, much more mobile. They can work from home. We've got Citrix connections. Um, and we also have uh, an intranet. So if we want to push information out to staff, they know that there's a central place. And every now and then we'll put like something fun or some kind of a raffle or something. So it keeps people going back to that site. So we really try and engage the folks that work for us. Um, Last year, for the first time, we were, we were recognized as a top workplace. We were one of, I think, four nonprofits that were at that particular meeting. So what does this mean? What does being a top workplace mean? You like working there. Mm -hmm. What's that? People like working there. Yeah, and it's a pretty cool process for folks who haven't experienced it. The Free Press asks your employees to go on and, and log on and respond to questions. And one of the questions in the survey is, did you feel compelled to respond to this survey? So it's 100% voluntary, right? And we've done really well on all fronts except what? I just mentioned it. We don't pay people, right? That's the consistent sort of like nick that we get. But we still manage to get in here. Well, you know, the reason that we're in there is because we signed up to be in there. Right, so now we have a little thing that we can put on our website and we can sort of talk to people at the contractual level when we're bidding competitively and when we talk about the value that we bring organizationally to the community, we can say, well, you know, beyond the scope of helping kids and families, we also treat people really well on the employment front. We all know employment is a little bit of a hot topic these days. Right, so there's sort of like residual stuff that happens that might not be readily apparent, but you, you, if you get a little creative and think outside the box, it has lots of value to you in other ways beyond simply the logo. Bob? Yeah, Bob, what, when you were looking at your situation, you know, let's say back in 2006, 2007, how would you characterize that? What was the collar when what? We referenced those years? What was, the, what was the main challenge that you had? And what did you do, what did the organization do to address that? Like, how did things turn around? That's a great question, Bob. Um, so I'll give my personal opinion. This is not a corporate response. This is a Bob Blumenfeld response. Uh, I mentioned that we were, a, for a long time, a foster care and adoption agency. Right? Anybody here ever work with the founder of an organization? Right? <laughs> Some people may be founders of organizations. And what happens with the founders sometimes? Sometimes. It's their baby, right? It's their baby, and it rightfully is. Right? I don't argue with that. But sometimes, I guess I could go back a few slides, the rules change, and the baby doesn't. Right? It's still their baby. So I think my answer to your question is, we really, and it took us four years. I want to emphasize that, too. Like we continued to have losses, and the losses were mounting. At some point, somebody, and it wasn't a founder who was in place either, just for, for perspective. But we had a lot of organizational people who had been there for decades. And it was their baby, too. Now it was everybody's baby. And we are foster care and adoption, and that is what we do, even though the census in foster care and adoption was just declining precipitously. What ended up happening was we had the no money, no mission conversation. And it came from a board member. And basically, he said in a board meeting, if this goes on, heads are going to roll. Well, I think those kind of statements get people's attention. And I think it's really good when it comes from somebody who's not a staff person. Right now, this is really an independent, maybe somewhat less vested, nothing bad about board people, but it's different when you're getting a paycheck than when you're sort of volunteering, even though you may have that heartfelt commitment. I think that kind of woke us up a little bit. And it wasn't that the information wasn't being presented. I think we were almost like shocked, like deer in the headlights. And I'm part of that group, so I'm not saying anything bad about anybody that I'm not saying about myself. I think we needed a little bit of a hello. Once we got that, I think things really sort of helped uh, 
uh, we helped each other kind of, kind of get our minds around what to do. And then we had a really um, meaningful, heartfelt, painful, rigorous, long-winded, like many conversations, meeting about what we were going to do, and we came up with a strategy. And the strategy was we saw that the policy direction was prevention versus intervention, and we leapt on the family preservation model. And we changed who was writing our grants, because we had been doing that for some time without success. So we shifted a couple of people on the bus, moved them into different seats, and, and the rest is, is history. Okay? Who was involved in that conversation, Bob? Say? Who was involved in that conversation? Was it uh, board members and staff? Uh, no. No, the initial conversation was just staff. But then the follow-up conversation was telling the board that we needed to do some fundraising. And I think we did that really, really uh, thoughtfully as well, because we didn't, the staff didn't tell them that, we hired a consultant. <laughs> right? And the nice thing, like some people say consultants are people that you pay to tell you what you want to hear. Well, we hired a consultant to pay, well, we paid a consultant to tell the board what we wanted them to hear. Right? Maybe not what they wanted to hear, but what we wanted them to hear. And frankly, it's the truth. But we didn't have any targets on our backs. We weren't the messenger that was getting shot at. Mm -hmm. We had somebody come in and do an independent evaluation. And it wasn't a secret, right? I mean, our government revenues are declining. And every other organization that's been around for 50 years, we're celebrating our 50th year this year, our, our endowment is woefully inadequate compared to many of our peers because we never made it a priority. And now we have, and I personally am thinking. Yes, ma'am. Was your predicament of lack of funds uh, reflected around in other organizations? Was it the time, or was it the way the staff and the board didn't work well together? Or um, I would say the answer to that question is yes. Okay. Right. So we were definitely not alone, and I mentioned some of the residential providers as that foster care census was declining. A lot of the foster care providers were experiencing similar things. The thing that we did more effectively than some of our peers was we targeted strategically where we could make a difference in our organization and in our mission. And it was painful, I gotta tell you. I mean, there were tears, there were shouting, uh, you know, there was some question about this is really mission drift. We, we were dedicated to finding kids' home, homes and not necessarily for working with families to keep their kids in them. Well, you know, I don't know, is there anything wrong with keeping a kid at home? Right, like we always go through this quick vignette, I'll go through this quick vignette. You know, you have a, a, a kid who goes to school every Monday and they eat voraciously and they're taking food off other kids' trays and somebody makes a complaint and there's an investigation. They go out to the home and they find out that the refrigerator and the car are broken and they have no way to work and they have no way to get food at home and when they do get food at home, they have no way to store it. That's a darn good reason to fix a refrigerator and a darn bad reason to take a kid away from their parents, right? So we kind of, we did a lot of storytelling, we did a lot of message crafting, we really worked together as a team at the staff level to get our ducks lined up so that when we made our presentation, it was kind of tough to say no, right? Um, so I'm pretty much wrap, wrapped up. Um, just a couple of quick things from the fiscal vantage point. Um, we changed our model from being accounting to being customer service. That was a real game changer for us. It doesn't matter if somebody's petty cash form is late. It's probably late because they had to go buy somebody something at the last minute that they really needed. So we got to respond to that. Um, we definitely moved away from sort of a structured approach to finance and into more one of being nimble. So we do a ton of our work outside of our accounting package and in Excel. It just gives us a lot of ability to massage data, analyze it in different ways. We have no accounts receivable to package. All of our billing is done through our Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we've done a lot of systems integration. So we make sure that our client data management system talks seamlessly with our accounting package. So when we have to do a foster parent pay for 280 foster parents, we get that entire data dumped into our accounting system and it generates the checks for us with three or four pushes of a button, but not 280 entries. My last thing, I would suggest that if we add numbers, we're going to miss an opportunity to add value. 
Any questions? You, Sir? you mentioned that you do recognition differently. Um, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, we have a lot of random recognitions gas cards, gift cards, and I'm not talking about like $100, I'm talking about like maybe $10 or $20. Um, we have connected with a lot of the sports organizations, so we get lots and lots of free tickets to events, and to other community organizations, theaters, um, uh, and we sent some folks out to a, a NASCAR race at Michigan Speedway, um, which I guess is technically a sport. I'm just giving myself away in terms of my NASCAR familiarity. Yes. Um, so any opportunity that we have to connect our people with community activities, we, we definitely do that. Um, we also make sure at like those quarterly meetings, if somebody's done something really good, um, our chief operating officer is really committed to getting information flowing up about really positive stories and people going, above and beyond what their job description would indicate. And we make sure to recognize those people publicly as often as possible. Those are just some, some snippets. I'm sure Bob, one of the things, things that um, I really, I think is just tremendous that you mentioned is that you had a board member that was willing to, you know, sort of maybe without even realizing it, kind of go out on a little bit of a limb and really kind of call things as he or she saw them at the time, you know, that this is serious, we need to look at this and we need to, we need to um, really kind of take a step back is what I'm hearing in terms of really assess what we're doing and, and where we're headed. And then, of course, you know, you and the team and the executive team have to sort of embrace that uh, and kind of move forward and, and, and change, you know, your direction a bit or a lot. But, um, you know, I think that's that governance aspect. We were talking, I was talking with some other people this morning and you know, that piece of things is so important have that kind of that chief skeptic or that person at, on, on the board level that has um, some influence and in, 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 uh, a voice that's heard that can really change the direction of the organization. Absolutely. Um, one of the key um, new programs that we've added that is solely donor funded is a camp program for kids every summer that's free. And it serves a couple of purposes. It gives kids sort of like life changing events. And when I say that, that's kind of like overused, right? If you take a kid whose world is four blocks big and you put him out in the forest, it is a life changing event, like hands down. So, and you're with them there in the forest, right? You don't just put him out. There. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a different kind of life changing event. Um, a board member took personal responsibility for going out and saying, I am going to raise the money every year to make sure that kids go to camp, and has for the last six years now. So you're absolutely right. Um, the only other thing I would add is that there was a meeting that occurred before that board member sort of stepped up and might have been a little bit of an incentive, and I kind of lost my cool. I'm typically a pretty together guy, but we were at a board meeting, and I was reporting the financials, and they were pretty bleak. This was like one of the worst presentations I had had to make. And one of the board members said, why are we just hearing about this now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I actually kind of like lost my cool <laughs> but I said, in, in kind of a yeah. diplomatic way, right, I said, you know, if you'd like me to go get the board reports for the last two and a half years, I would be more than happy to do that. I'm not sure why you're just hearing about this now myself. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a risk, but you know what? At that point, I really had nothing to lose. So I think that maybe yeah. teed it up yeah. at right. the next, sure. it wasn't the next board meeting, it was the board meeting after that, for somebody to go, you know what, the, yeah. the emperor has no clothes, yeah. but we need to move on from where we are and stop accepting this as the norm. Yes, very good. Very good. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> budgets at Wild is about $200,000. And so it came up in our finance committee, which we meet monthly with our finance committee. What kind of coverage should Huawei have? We have a lot of single employees, but we do extend coverage to families and for spouses. It came up, should we continue this? And so I sent an email out in August just asking the other not-for-profits simple questions like, what kind of coverage do you have? Um, and so then, Bobby asked me, would I mind compiling this information and presenting it? 
So that's how this all started. And it's a it's very draft, the sheet that I passed out. Um, but I know for, for me, I don't even do the benefits. I, I'm, we have an HR person that negotiates the prices, but I, one of the projects I would like to get involved in is really working on, um, we haven't done a lot of price comparison at Pawabic, and it's something that we really should be doing just to make sure that we're getting the best benefits for our employees at the most reasonable cost for Pawabic. So what I've done is the people that I heard from, um, I just put it in a spreadsheet. And what I'd like to do is just also add some additional information that we'd like to obtain. What I did ask, I just asked who the provider was. And then um, for mostly health I had, but we also had um, dental and vision. So I would like to capture that information from all the groups and then also what coverage is offered. And it was interesting that every one that did respond is offering family coverage. But it depended, you know, um, what percentage was covered was, it did vary. So I captured that. The, the first group is employee contribution for individual coverage and then employee contribution for spouse and family coverage. And then I also um, captured the benefit agency. If they, I didn't ask that originally, but a couple people did offer that. And I think that's good information for all of us because if there is an agency that really has been helpful, um, you know, we could all benefit from knowing that. And some of the information that I would like to obtain if people are willing to you know, email me the information, I'll capture it and email it back out, what the deductibles and co-payments are. So we can really try to get comparison, you know, apples to apples comparison for what our benefit co costs are for not-for-profits. Um, and I know at Wombic we teeter between anywhere from 26, 23 to 26 that are covered. And it, we've been told like 25 is kind of the benchmark of really being able to get a more co cost-effective um, price structure for our benefits. So, I would like to also know short-term disability, life, and optional coverage. Those are some things that we do cover at Puabic. And then also, who is eligible? At Puabic, it's if you work 30 hours or more, then you are eligible for benefits. Um, and then the actual benefit cost, if we could capture that. I know for our single, for Puabic, it's about $450 a month for a single. Um, I think it's close to 900 for um, a spouse and then 1100 for family coverage. So family coverage is significantly more expensive, obviously, than um, our single coverage. So Heather, ideally, we would take this session and move forward, you know, to open it up to, uh, I'm sure others want to be a part of this and, um, you know, provide more, the more information. Yeah, more coverage, information. This, this is just, like I said, yeah, a very rough great. draft just to kind of introduce if you guys are interested in getting this, I'm more than happy to capture and put it together in the spreadsheet and then just email it out. Um, and if you have other ideas, if you want to ask, you know, I can add them now onto this list or you know, just email me what other information and I can email it out to the rest of the group. Yes. What's your email address? You know, I have cards. Why don't I pass okay. out um, my business cards? Yeah, and Carl, thanks for asking that too. Um, I have a pretty good roster. If um, When you came in, if you looked at the you know the check-in sheet or whatever if there's anything incorrect on that or if there are any edits to be made um, let me know or just go ahead and make them on the sheet at the table in the front um, but I will send out a um, contact list to everybody um, within a week or so of this session um, and that'll help also I think with some of the inner uh, the communication in between sessions overall the percentage you mentioned that you have the largest line item or what percentage well, not of our payroll, but like our expense line item. I mean, salaries are obviously, our benefits and salary are, but um, I would say 70 to 80% of our total right. expense costs. And our benefit um, is, you know, I'm not sure the percentage. Yeah. Um, but, and, and it really fluctuates from, you know, the individual too. And that's one of the things, we just went to Paychex HR Online, and one of the things that, uh, Paychex HR online we're going to give to each of our employees this is what your salary was as of the end of the year um, you know if we paid out any bonuses and this is what we also paid out in benefits including you know health care short-term disability you know life because for a lot of our employees we have a lot of this is their first job right out of college they're not really you know looking at we hear complaints all the time that we don't pay very much 
but we do have a fairly gener generous benefit package, even time off. And so we really want to capture that, and it's actually a pie chart that this HR Online will provide for each individual employee. And so they can really start capturing and just saying, well, you know, there is a benefit besides financial benefit from working at Plavix, so. I know the benchmarking, it came up <coughs> at a board meeting um, recently, you know, that, that I was a part of. And um, I, I think this is, you know, this is a really big area that is getting a lot of review from a cost standpoint and everything else right now. And then you open the door to the vacation and second personal, it's just yeah. you know, double the amount of complexity to really sort through all that. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's fantastic that we're looking at that. And I think the more the more that we'd be willing and interested in participating in that would be good information, I think. And one of the things that I've suggested to our HR department is to go ahead and survey employees. You know, what are you, what are you, do you like about our benefits, what don't you like? We went from a two hundred and fifty dollar deductible for single to over a thousand dollar deductible. And we have people that make less than $10 an hour. And it's really hard for these people. They don't participate in their benefits because they can't afford to. So, um, and that's one of the struggles we have. What can we afford? But well, we want to make sure that the benefits can be used and are truly a benefit to our employees. I, I don't know if this will be inherent it's just with people's responses, but I'd be interested to know who's uh, providing high deductible health plans yeah. and if they're making a contribution for the employee. Yeah. I mean, I think that's great because our ours is considered now high deductible, and we didn't go um, into we we did look into the um, HMA or the FSA, um, but we couldn't fund it. We don't have the cash to go ahead and fund any of that. We had in high deductible. We switched to traditional, and now everyone wants us to switch. The employees want us to switch back. It's really? actually costing them more on the traditional. So because yeah. they're single and they're young, they don't go to that. Is it isn't everything high deductible now? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it depends on where you draw the line, right? Yeah. Well, then the question is, is how much of their HSA you fund for them? Yeah, and I can definitely add it on to this. Right. So if you're going to email that question, and then we'll just... I will it. respond and I'll... Yeah, that'd be great. We're going to make Heather regret ever volunteering. <laughs> oh, I know, that's how I This is my first meeting, too, and I remember I would just add, too, because um, we were just discussing this back at our agency, because of the um, um, pulling benefits are like way when budgets budgets were declining, um, AdVacs, 401k match, flex accounts, and if anyone pays out for waiving health benefits, there's any yeah. benchmark yeah. dollar figures for that, mm -hmm. um, would be neat to see also. Yeah. This has the makings of a task force. <laughs> <laughs> I think more in all encompassing benefits and not so much just health, but all yeah. fringe yeah. benefits is a whole yeah. package. Right, absolutely. We were yeah. talking about um, Four through B's, and I actually just said it's something we should add to this as well. Yeah. It might also be helpful to, um, to to get a sense of how large the organizations are, like yes. maybe just mm -hmm. the general budget size, because it may it may vary. Yeah. That way. The number of employees. Yeah, yeah I got that. Yeah. For, um, well, number of covered employees, but actually number, number of covered employees in comparison to the number of total employees, right. I think is a really good idea. Right. So um, for those of you who are in the Cultural Alliance have heard me talk about this before. I'm Jennifer Hill with ArtServe Michigan, and I'm the um, coordinator for the Cultural Data Project in Michigan. And the Cultural Data Project captures all this information. So if you have entered your information into the Cultural Data Project in the CDP, um, it's, um, you're going to have the ability to run comparison reports based on geography. So you could also um, use that tool so you wouldn't have to retype everything and send it back to her. Um, you can generate your own comparison report to send her the, the only, then you get a PDF. You could talk to the help desk about how, or the Cultural Alliance yeah. could probably help um, pull that information together so that you don't have to re-enter the information, because at least it's last year's information, but you'll have that information in CDP and the ability to run that report. And yeah, those of you that are cultural organizations, um, you could still put your information in CDP, but it's a lot of work. Well, maybe, maybe there's really a role that. for that. <laughs> maybe there's a role for that somewhere in this bigger project. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe we have that as a piece of you know the data, and then obviously others as well um, as we go ahead and, and gather that. But it might be that you know the more the more information, the better, and that's a good source of information. Too. And that would give you a national benchmark. Yeah. Because there's um, twelve thousand organizations. So you have the ability to look nationally 
and with the with these um, with the benefits being by budget size and by employee size. Well, thank you, and thank you. please just email me your information and any other information that we want to capture. Um, so well, why don't we, if you guys could email me um, in the next, you know, by the end of the week, what other questions you want to add to this, and then I'll just email the spreadsheet out to everybody, and then um, with the information that we want to capture. You can just email it back, and um, then I'll compile it and send it back out. Thank you. All right, thanks. I think we're going to have just a few minutes of, uh, of hearing about the Cultural Alliance and our efforts in uh, financial services. And forgive me right off the, the top for my uh, voice. I'm getting over a cold, and uh, so I'll just try to talk quickly and clearly. Um, the Cultural Alliance is a, an association, a member service group that, that uh, serves about 130 of the nonprofit arts and culture organizations in the seven counties of southeastern Michigan. So uh, it's not quite five years old and uh, was started in the first year with about 30 organizations and has grown to this number of both the very largest organizations in the region, what you think of as your major visible anchors, to the very smallest organizations that work more locally and have real high impact you know, in neighborhoods and in the community. So, and what we do mostly is work on uh, research. You, you heard uh, Jennifer Hill talk about the Cultural Data Project, which is a national project that ArtServe Michigan is, is um, leading and, and coordinating. And, uh, and we help our, our member organizations to know how to do that and make sure that they get trained in it. It's something that, uh, if, when I'm done, you might want to talk a little bit more about it because I think that the impact of data and all of you being financial people, numbers people, there really isn't um, a, a, a good way to avoid an impact that you can see in black and white. And as you said, Bob, you're talking about your impact and you're talking, your, your presentation I thought was excellent in that it was not just financial. It really talked about how you know, the rest of the organization is impacted by the finances and then what you do about that and, and how to react to it. Because we have seen a few organizations, not really that many, but a few organizations who couldn't take that next step and no one did take that leadership and, and uh, heads did that. So I, I do think that uh, Jennifer has some, you know, real exciting, uh, actually a handout to show you because what the organizations who are entering their data into this, this uh, system, this database, which is funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts and many others here in Michigan. There, there is a whole list including the State Arts Council and, in, and, and most of the major foundations. But it captures all of that data. And those of you who have filled it out and have spent the approximately 11 hours doing so, um, you know, it, it, it is a challenge to get it in. Uh, because it isn't just taking it from your audit and your 990, you really have to understand your programs and you have to understand how that equates. And once you do that, um, it is sort of like, um, you know, giving birth. You, you go to <laughs> and then you have this wonderful thing that if everybody can do that, you have a voice. You have a voice, it's, in this case, it's the cultural nonprofit sector, and that isn't the whole. Sector. I mean, there are many for-profit uh, cultural organizations that have lots more visibility, do lots more marketing, and they have a business uh, model that uh, is not mission-driven. It is dollar-driven. It's bottom line. -driven. So it is something that uh, if there are others, and I suspect there will be, um, you know, come a time when there will be other kinds of databases that you all could be, certainly the Cultural Alliance members who are here, and I'm really glad to see all of you and meet some of you. Um, but even in, in the human services, and, and, and hopefully we'll even have time to maybe do go around and see who is who in, yeah, in, in yeah, this yeah, circle. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll have time because um, many of us are, are new, and uh, I, I do think that uh, it would behoove 
everybody to pay attention to how this data could actually collectively help you to, to make that case, as Bob was talking about. I mean, it's it really, when you look at jobs, when you look at children's serve, when you look at meals, you look at all of those things, um, there is something that the nonprofit sector is doing that the for-profit sector can't do because they can't make money at it. And that's why we do um, what we do every day. So um, back to the Cultural Alliance and how we are involved here today. Uh, Jerry, you mentioned that we're a sponsor. Well, we're, we're only a sponsor in that we really do believe in what you have been doing since 2008, following your 2006 and 2007 uh, report and, and what was needed. And uh, we had the opportunity through a, a grant that, was, uh, that took place, um, actually the whole process of deciding some, some, some models, some, some funding pilots, uh, that took place about two years ago. And we, through our partner, the Michigan Nonprofit Association, there was funding from the Ford Foundation in New York and the Kresge Foundation to explore what those things were that the Cultural Alliance members those people who serve both the very large institutions and the smallest ones, what was needed? What could they work on together that they could get more out of than trying to do themselves? So that's where that strategic alliance came in. And there, were, there was really a year-long planning process, and uh, it was facilitated by um, planners, strategic planners, and people who really are well-versed in, in, in the nonprofit world. And out of that, nine uh, proposals were made for funding, and six were actually funded. And the financial services system is one of those six, and it is coordinated by the Cultural Alliance, as is our Culture Volunteer Program. What this did then was, uh, in the first year, uh, the Cultural Alliance worked with Apparatus Solutions, and Carolyn Birdie is here from from Apparatus Solutions, which is a for-profit financial management firm in Detroit. And what we are, are two of the three legs of the financial services system. Uh, Apparatus Solutions, and, and Carolyn particularly, went in and did assessments of ten, the 10 pilot organizations that were involved in creating the proposal and, and really pulling this together and, and finding out what they needed in terms of financial services. And several of you are here. The Detroit Children's Choir and, and Peg with Arts and Scraps. And I think that's it of this. But there are 10 organizations who have gone through a very exhaustive uh, assessment to see not only what their financials are, but what their processes are. And, and, and of course, that, that leads over into a lot of HR issues, governance issues, record keeping, all of the things that are back of house in the arts as opposed to on the stage. So um, those have been completed and really to identify what are the gaps because we all have them. You know, what are, what are you not doing that you really should be doing or that you could be doing better? And then identifying priorities that um, I think that together it was they were discussing. So maybe it was the financial person or maybe the treasurer or maybe both. Um, the board chair, uh, it varied among the, the 10 organizations. But then to really get it down to what are those things that you have to put on the top of the list right now. And that's what they're doing. What would be there an example some, of something without an, specifics? Just an example. An example might an be something or, like uh, getting their QuickBooks set up in a way that, that uh, aligns with their um, annual budget planning. Okay. Um, Carolyn, you were in it. The, what, what organizations it? with no account numbers. Chart of accounts that have no account oh. numbers, uh, board reporting packages. Um, you know what financial statements and reports are going to be a standard reporting package for the next one. So you can see yeah. that most of these organizations were mid-size and small. There was mm -hmm. one that that would be the the largest is a mid-size yeah. organization um, that would be somewhere between three and five million. So nothing like the worlds that you all probably come from. But these are you know small arts yeah. organizations that really do need this and frankly nobody is going to take the time because a lot of these organizations are ones where people wear lots of hats. I mean they are they're washing the grapes before the show opens and you know for the audience. I mean it is that kind of a, of a situation and they're all capable of it but having the help 
And, and I think that that is that's key to this, is having the help. The second part of the system is the educational part, and that's what I've been doing, uh, working with the apparatus as we see what those needs are that are emerging. What is the theme? Where are where is there a lot of commonality in those needs? To try to develop ways that that um, these organizations or, or any nonprofit can get some help in terms of uh, better educating themselves. Uh, now. Again, you all are, are those people. In fact, uh, you probably, you know, many of you have staffs where these, these organizations don't. But sometimes, you know, it is worthwhile to take a class or a workshop if you can learn one or two good things, but that still doesn't really take care of it all because you, you don't want to read the manual. You just want the work done. And if you don't have somebody to do that, it's not going to happen. So that's where apparatus comes in, and we really feel that apparatus itself is developing a, a, a great skill and, and knowledge of the nonprofit arts and culture sector in working with our members, so that uh, other members who are not part of this pilot could go to them and say, we have a need, can you help us? And uh, that's something that we really didn't have. I mean, I used to be at an organization and if we did have a need for a financial person, it really was, who do you know? Who do you know? How much do they charge? Um, if you go through a service, what's the upcharge? What's it going to cost me beyond paying that? And what do you get? So that, that we feel, is another reason for developing a, an expertise within a firm that has their own people doing that work. We've also developed a website, and um, I encourage any and all of you to go to uh, the Cultural Alliance website, which is, just as it sounds, Cultural Alliance, S-E-M-I, which is southeastmichigan.org. And within that, uh, we developed a financial services section of the website. And in that, we have things in, so that if you are learning, if you're looking to learn, you're looking to take a class, a workshop, something like that, we actually did uh, a pretty complete view, we hope, and we're always asking for more. So if you go there and you know of a program that's not listed, please let me know. And, and my name is all over that section of our website. But so that there are these classes and workshops, then there are tools and resources. And, and many and many organizations have these, but they're, they're ones that you can do quick links to exactly to where you want to go for nonprofit financial or governance uh, information. And then finally, the third piece, besides the transactional or financial management and educational, the third piece is the connectivity. And that's why we are so excited to be here today, because this is something that has been developed by Lawrence Tech, by Jerry, by Bob, facilitating this. And so, and then we learned that many of you are already members of the, the Learning Circle, who are also members of the Cultural Alliance, which makes sense. So we decided that we really needed to let all of our members know if they want to participate with you. Um, and then we may be doing some exploring about doing our own, uh, in terms of workshops that are specific to arts and culture. CDP is a great example. And Jennifer's been doing, you know, leading those workshops and they are underway. But for instance, we may have a workshop or, or a, a, a day long probably not a day long, a half day seminar on, okay, you've got your data in, now what? Right. So that you can learn about how to generate those reports, what the data means, and how you can use it in your advocacy, in your marketing, and even to let your own, uh, your own audience, your, your, your first audience, which is your employees and staff. If you're fortunate to have a, a staff of 236 FTEs, then you've got a lot of people who need to believe in you and in the work that you're doing. And by having that kind of data that you can just pull out and say, um, look, this is what we do, and this is where we do it, and, and that's something that's very powerful. So, so really, as I say, financial management, education, and connecting to each other. Uh, and I do hope that, um, that those of you who come can make those relationships and be able to say, um, can I call you? You know, you were talking about such and such. I, I really, I didn't really want to raise my hand and get into all of it because we've got 
kind of this delicate situation. But maybe you could talk to each other, and that's something that no seminar class, online, offline, is really going to do, is, is to have that trust built and, and make those connections for you. So I, I uh, really appreciate those of you who've been through the whole spiel on financial services at our member meeting, and uh, at least you didn't have to have a PowerPoint. And uh, are there any questions about it? Have any of you been involved in something like this within your own sector? Um, I mean, not at the not at the finance level, but at the advocacy level and at the fundraising level. And okay. anytime, I, I guess the one plug I would make on your behalf is sometimes it's tough to kind of cross that bridge, right? To kind of say I'm going to put some trust in other people and put my you know my fate in their hands. And but invariably, anytime we've done that, we have benefits tremendously so yeah and I think that you're, you're you're spot on when you say that not on the finance level because even with the member meetings that we have for our members which are four times a year you know who do we have we've got the executive director we've got a marketing person maybe development person that's you know, so when you're all sitting around the staff well, okay who's going to go to the cultural alliance member meeting is it ever the finance person no, they're back doing. You know. <laughs> um, and that's, there, there's a reason for it, but I do think that there, there can be times like this when you can connect to your peers, and that's what we're talking about, peer support. There isn't anything else. Thank you very much. Okay, we're in the uh, last segment of our session. We'll probably get now to a a mode that we're to move a little bit more intimate here. Um, we'll get to a mode that we typically have. Any of you that have been in, in, at the sessions before, where it's a little bit more to the members themselves, and um, we don't have a ton of time. But what I'd like to do is we didn't really do an introductory um, person by person uh, at the beginning of the session. I'd like to just have each person, if we could go around the room, name, organization. And if you have anything, um, you can certainly put it on the evaluations for uh, future topics, um, things that we should consider um, as we look to construct the next session. Um, but you know, a lot of things come to my mind in the course of the, of the session today in terms of future topics or things that maybe we even want to assign to ourselves, maybe even in smaller teams, to come back to the table and, and talk about or explore everything from, you know, uh, Governance to the benchmarking uh, in, in all facets, and, you know, the health and uh, benefits um, we talked about, but there's obviously uh, endless amounts of benchmarking. Are there any topics, issues, challenges, anything we should be considering as we develop um, the topics of the agenda for the next session? So, Jennifer, why don't we just kind of start? I don't know how to do it here. Start with you and make our way through the room um, and just do an introduction and anything that comes to mind. So. Jennifer Hill, Arts of Michigan. Cultural Data Project is a national program of the Pew Charitable Trust out of Philadelphia. You've probably heard the name. It, uh, CDP is um, active in 11 states. It's going to be in 20 states by the end of 2014. You put in your um, annual financial information, your closed book information and program information. How many people did you serve? Um, how many people hit your website? all that different information that's never been collected in one place before. And then you're given access to 77 different reports that look like this. Pre-programmed, you don't have to do the graphics, you just click a button and it's done. And you have the ability, once you are review complete, all the data is reviewed twice. There's a computer error check for math, then a human being in Philadelphia actually prints your profile and reads it to make sure that the errors that wouldn't have been caught things like um, the size of your venue is not compared to your audience. And so there was a case where an organization said they had a 200 square foot theater, but they had 100,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> and so that information, so that when you go in and do the comparison, these are some of the best numbers we've ever had. And I can tell you that just yesterday, speaking of advocacy, um, ArtServe uh, staff met with the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee for Michigan, and we have new number, we have the numbers for 2009 for the first time, and we're going to be putting out a report that looks a lot like this. We can say that arts and culture is a half a billion dollar industry in Michigan. And by making the numbers 
a little bit more exciting with lots of bright green colors. <laughs> and um, we are demonstrating our impact in a way that we never could before. So know that your numbers yesterday moved the Senate Appropriations Committee to take seriously our request to increase funding for Michigan. And so not a done deal, you know, a long, long, long ago, we're all fighting over that $285 million. It's not a lot of money. But that we are, that we can do this is a huge step forward. Um, there are 18 funders in Michigan that um, are funding this. It's actually not funded by Pew. Pew manages it. But each state pays for its, its sector to take part. And so, um, and then some fund foundations are either recommending or requiring that you use CDP because you can then generate a funder report that looks like this. And so you enter your data once and click the button and then this funder, this funder, this funder, it all comes out on that. Um, I have, um, I brought one report because I think Carol and I are going to be meeting. So I have one example of everything. I have a sheet that shows everything. Um, and there's a lot of capacity. We're just getting started. The tool only went live May 2010. So we're just getting started with all this. But know that ArtServe is going to be taking this data forward. And, um, and, and, it's not, but, and it's not that we own it either. I don't want to leave you with that impression. You have the ability to access this information and do your comparison reports yourself. So, and certainly working with Cultural Alliance and other regional alliances across the state. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that the foundation community is going to make free to the nonprofits forever. It's one of the um, standards that Pew has in running this program. So there's a lot of capacity. Joe, what do you know? I'm Joe Pruitt. I'm with the American Cancer Society. And uh, one of the things I would suggest going forward would yeah. be um, cash flow management um, and you know, working capital management, um, financial health indicators, um, when to invest in new programs versus you know maintain existing programs, that, that all that kind of financial management. Of, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Joe sent out one time that operating reserves Toolkit, do you remember that? Right, yeah. That uh, I still, I mean, that is a fantastic document. Right. Um, I don't remember all the funders that put that, you know, that made that happen. But I know you, you sent it out to a few of the members that were asking, and I've read it over. Um, I think Bob and I have looked at it uh, on a finance committee um, to use it, you know, as a starting point at least for discussion. It's basically an appreciation for capital, operating reserves, and a way, a methodology to, to look at that. So I'm with you on that. I think that's fantastic. And those kinds of topics are really significant. So. And, and I enjoyed the benefit presentation and I think more of that. I think we can all, you know, you know talent, you know, talking about talent and being talent is a, is a great topic. And obviously, the American Cancer Society, not in the arts, but watching my son in community theater this weekend, it's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All we can do is make it. Awesome. Uh, I'm Barbara, and I'm a volunteer at a very exciting village. It's similar to Henry Ford, but on a smaller scale. It's called Latroy Historic Village at Waddles in Livernois. Uh, we were owned and operated by the city of Troy, and they threw us under the bus. And we <laughs> and were closed you are on camera, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not funded by them at all. Uh, so we have the Historical Society, which picked us up, thank goodness, and they now uh, sponsor us, but we still are always looking for grants and uh, extra money. And my only little job is to be on the board and operate the village store, which is like once you pass through our nine building, and it is unique, it's very fun. Uh, then you come to the store, and we have all these little things that you can buy, and I manage that. So I'm here to realize the, the impact of managing your money. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Gwen Rosso. I'm the VP of Finance with the Birmingham Bloomfield Art Center. And I'm very glad that I got the email from the Cultural Alliance that this group existed. Um, very excited about that. I think there was a comment about, well, there, when you go to the Cultural Alliance, do I ever get to go? No. <laughs> <laughs> Like-minded people. Um, so that's really exciting. And um, Bob had mentioned in your 
presentation about that you're really good at board communications and putting together presentations for them. I would like to see something like that. Mm. I think that new um, ideas in that regard are really helpful because I think people get used to seeing, okay, well here's a report, it looks the same every month, and it's easy for people to say, oh, well, why, how do I just hear about this now? Mm. So I think those sort of communications are very important, very helpful. Yeah, Jerry. If I could just interject on that, I, Bob has a, uh, Bloomfeld has a lot to offer on that. I also recommend Bob Seastat's three-hour boardwalk presentation that he does. He's been doing it. It's, we have a board training series board called Boardwalk. Yeah. Eight different workshops, three hours, thirty-five dollars a workshop, targeted to board members. It really is uh, uh, all professional presenters. Bob has, Seastat has developed a really engaging way uh, format for engaging non-financial board members, you know, invite them into that beyond the step beyond that anxiety and really to begin to understand how to engage the financials at the board level. So anyway, uh, there's, that's a really great point. Yeah, I think making board um, reports and communication conversational about if you agree with that but to me that and, and I can't say that I'm great at it but I know that when it does spark conversation I think is when <clears throat> the finance people have done their job you know I mean that's it's tough to do sometimes I know that but uh, yeah any tools that you have or anyone else has to yeah, do that would be great. To me that's sort of a funny thing. It. I've been in finance you know my entire career so I take things for granted and I was also on the board of the Art Center before I became a staff member. And, but I'm always tuned into it. Mm -hmm. And I expect, okay, well, the other board members are for the most part business people, so they know about these things, but that's not the case. I found that. And I need to alter my thinking. Yeah, that's great. My, my um, perception is I've talked to even family members that are on boards and whatnot, and they, they typically will say it's the, um, it's the person that isn't necessarily in the business world, it's someone volunteering their time, um, that almost doesn't know enough to, 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 um, to not ask the tough questions and whatnot. A lot of times you get the best questions from people that you would not necessarily think because maybe they don't have a lot of business background and things like that, but they will ask those questions and it's kind of like, wow, that was, you know, we took a lot of things for granted or we assumed a lot and um, uh, by asking a question could prompt really good dialogue and conversation. So good, I'll add that to the list too for um, future discussion topics. John? Hi, I'm John Wenzel. I'm the CFO from Detroit Public Television. Uh, I have a couple of thoughts uh, topics uh, uh, that are actually very current for me. Uh, one is uh, the issue to have whether or not an organization needs both an audit committee and a finance committee. Uh, that's a hot topic for my board right now. Um, secondly, um, uh, another board-related kind of reporting uh, issue is uh, the use of dashboards for uh, board members. Uh, my board chair has recently uh, made some requests to do a monthly uh, communication in the form of a dashboard to okay. all board members. We have a very large board. We have over 40 members on our board. So uh, that's a big challenge in and of itself. Uh, but I've got, so uh, I'm looking for help, uh, ideas, thoughts, examples. Um, can you clarify, do you have finance on it now? Or are you we, we just have finance. Just finance. And, uh, a couple of our board members have said that their experience and their um, what they've learned more and more is that it's appropriate to have both now. And uh, we've had a number of discussions uh, of our finance committee about that. And uh, uh, just more than well, in the last four months, we had a discussion, and they at that time had decided it wasn't necessary. Part of it was a resource issue too, of finding the right people to sit on to have a separate committee and with separate expertise to be able to fill both of both committees. That was, a real, that was a realistic issue that they were facing. But I think it's, uh, there's enough discussion that I can see that we're going to probably get to two committees yeah. uh, here pretty soon. I mean, okay. Um, and then thirdly, another uh, topic of interest lately, I don't know, benchmarking thing is the insurance coverage, uh, property and casualty mm -hmm. mainly. Uh, so, <laughs> 
And Bob, is it appropriate, because um, some of these topics come up, at least yeah. in my world, very you know quickly, and yeah. somebody wants to know, well, how do the rest of the organizations in town do it? Uh, typically, we've, we've had some via uh, yeah. method via uh, email to yeah. send out quick surveys kind yeah. of thing. Is that still yeah, a good way? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would offer that um, sometimes people just want, they don't necessarily want to name themselves in asking a question, and I'm glad to send out an email to the group. But if, if, if that's not the case, please, um, and, and I'll update the distribution list um, shortly for all of the new members we have. Please feel free to just reply to all. I know you know Facebook and LinkedIn and all that work too, but for some reason, just simple email seems to be sometimes the best. Um, also, with the with the contact list, I'll send that all to you. So if you just want to send one person or a couple organizations that you happen to know may are dealing with the same kinds of things, you'll be able to kind of pick and choose too. So we'll have a few different venues. We still have LinkedIn um, and all that, but I I don't know. It seems to me like. Just kind of the email blast to the group. Feel free to do it yourself, though. You don't. I, you don't have to go through me. I'm glad to do it if it's helpful. Okay. But uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Karen Ward from the Greening of Detroit Chief Financial Officer. Um, and for us right now, um, we, I have a personal hot topic, and we have an institutional hot topic. And um, the institutional hot topic is um, the whole conversation about. Um, unrestricted funding and how much do we need and is that appropriate level and how on earth do we get all that and um, you know we, we take baby steps daily to getting closer to um, to knowing um, how much we've raised and how much we can actually get into a grant yada 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 um, where we fall short at least in my opinion a lot is the justification for it because I I guess somewhat selfishly and haughtily think, uh, why do I have to explain this? This is normal. But um, apparently it requires a lot of explanation. I, I don't know. Um, and then the other thing that's sort of, uh, it's sort of a personal frustration that is just sending me over the edge is why on earth in the nonprofit sector can we not use the principle of matching, which totally works, and how do we get that changed so that it's the way that it's supposed to be and I can stop spending my life explaining why we made seven million dollars last year and this year we're gonna lose six and a half million. I don't they're you mean because so of the, stupid of the booking of, of revenue. Yeah. And, and yeah. They so created deferred it's income. A, it works in the non in the yeah, for profit yeah, world. Why on earth can't we use it where we need it's, it the most? It's unfortunate I think that yeah. we went to that. And like nobody everybody like takes it as like yeah. normal. I'm like it's not normal. Really I think this is not a normal thing. In the for-profit world, it totally works. Who is the brain trust that said we should? Well, it was we almost, don't have to have magic. It was almost overthought, I think, in some it's ways. It so much time, is. So. It just, I, you know, and so like I have conversations with my auditors. Should I keep two sets of books? I'm like, no, I don't want to do my work twice. I, it's all I can do one time. The, yeah, yeah, that's a good. That, you know, that's a good issue. it's just it just makes me crazy, and everybody just accepts it, and I'm like, you know, that's going to be my thing. I'm gonna like go to Congress and go look. Somebody's stupid. <laughs> Are there CPAs that invented it? I just yeah, I'm right. like, oh my gosh. Give me chanting for the 500 organizations following behind you. I right. love here and go. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing, and, and nobody can understand it. Not bankers, not board members. Right. Like, they're like, well, you should follow it through temporary. <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, it's just, it's true. Good point. Let's stop. Good point. We're going to be, I hate to push the group through here in terms of the, the uh, introductions. I'm sorry, just I so many things. No, no, it's been, it's been, it's great. I think this is the best part is to have the conversation going. Um, but let's kind of, let's go through. Carolyn, you see a lot. Um, I mean, you're the CFO yeah, of several nonprofits, so right. you must see a lot of things. That, right, right. I've been consulting with nonprofits um, for most of my career, um, 11 years, uh, predominantly the last 11 years. Um, a lot of people need forecasting, a lot of people need cash flow tools, a lot of people need some board policies, you know, in-kind donations, how are we going to book it, how are we going to value it, um, you know, what are we doing about investments, what are we doing about how we're classifying uh, restricted and unrestricted. Um, if we've got the board involved, it usually makes it a little easier then to make uh, the uh, calculations. And most people haven't involved their board and taken a policy to the board. And then be, beyond that, certainly I think that um, board packets, 
you know, which goes back to some of the conversation that's already here, but a lot of organizations um, need help with what's a standard package, what are standard reports, what really tells the story, what can be helpful. Well, and also getting them out, in my opinion, getting them out early enough so that they can be reviewed. You don't have to spend your whole meeting going through the board packet necessarily in great detail, but hopefully others come to the table with good topic or issues or things that they want to dive into. Jane, anything more to add? Uh, no, I really, okay. all of the above. Good, okay. I'm Deborah Flegel. I'm the COO at the Mosaic View Theater. Um, I have two hot topics now. One is a dashboard. Um, I come from the for long uh, career at, with the for-profit, and I know what it took to do dashboards there. Now board members who are from the for-profit are the owner of dashboards, and they have armies of people who do these mm -hmm. uh, metrics and tracking and pie charts and bar charts. And so I, I would love to um, have a session on how we can, as a nonprofit sector, uh, measure things that make sense and also educate the board as to the difference between the for-profit and the non-profit dashboard. And the second thing, just very quickly, is, um, and Bob, I was interested in what you had to say, um, how does the finance information and the finance team help the program team work through answering the question of what should our business model be? Um, we have information, and they think we're just um, spreadsheet people. Yet, they, and, and, but they need that information to really work through the business model and, and continuing to be sustainable. So how do we use their language? How do they um, appreciate our language? And if someone has a methodology for that, that kind of, not dumbs it down, but makes it well, I think, yeah, something like that, yeah, I think to the extent others would be willing, even if they, you know, kind of cross out figures or whatever, but however they'd be willing to share what they have and do. Um, I remember a long time ago, Jim, you had done that, you had shared some things. I think that was helpful to the group. That was going a ways back now. Um, but yeah, that kind of thing where we could bring examples, yeah. real life examples to the table would be, would be great. And that's how I think we increase our value yeah. in, the, in the eyes of the rest of the staff. Yeah. Those would be my... Good. And Heather Summit and all of the above. Okay, so this is really a great note. Okay. So thanks. Good. Uh, Brad Michaud, I'm CFO for Oakland Williams Human Service Agency. I guess the one being, we're 75% federally funded, so we're, our big thing now is looking at uh, economic development opportunities outside of federal funding and, you know, having assistance or trying to uh, develop, you know, business plans for those uh, opportunities as they roll along. So. New revenue streams, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah. Good. Do you have ideas? Not you don't have to share right now, but do you have I mean do you have things you you could bring to the table or things that have been discussed? We we've, we've got uh, some definite ideas. ideas. Yeah. We've got some definite ideas. Good. So yeah. Okay. So added. <laughs> I'm Carol Schock. I'm the Detroit Children's Choir. Um, I'm the founder. Um, I don't know a whole lot about finance, that's why I work with them. <laughs> yeah. um, my husband's a financial guy, but I have no idea. Um, so anyway, all I'm going to say is that um, I, we, we struggle because we're very much volunteer driven. I have a volunteer book, bookkeeper. Um, we send our books to an accountant once a year and, and just getting them ready to send to the accountant takes for us forever. Um, so it's just um, knowing the best you know, the best, uh, um, you know, the best processes that people go to. Most of, most, the hardest thing I find is keeping track of the in-kind side um, and just not having to do it all the, you know, at the end of the year and trying to regroup. Um, that just takes, that seems to absorb a lot of my time. That comes up time and time again. Um, I see it, you know, with many organizations, I get questions about, I think there was just something that I sent around recently to, to many of you. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, it's uh, one of those, if it's significant enough, you know, you have to deal with it. And, um, and it's, it, can, it can talk about making your financial statements distorted. It can, it can tell a better story or a truer story, but at the same time, mm. you have to be aware of you know, revenue that is in kind and, and how that's treated and reflected on the financials. Otherwise, 
you can misunderstand exactly you know what's happening in the organization. So. Yeah, because we actually have more <coughs> income than we have that cash <laughs> in our case. So. Yeah, and the valuation of it and everything else that comes into it. So. Carl? Okay, Carl Smith, CFO at Society of St. Vincent de Paul. And the things I think will be good for the future is when you get dashboards and the nitty gritty behind the dashboards. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, the property casualty insurance. It's a biggie, and also the uh, what type of data do you actually <coughs> present to the board so you don't so you don't fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> or do in some cases that's good. Which time you present? Which time? You <laughs> good. Mm -hmm. I'm Peg from Arts and Scraps. And I think this has been touched upon, but part of accounting and finance is to get all the right numbers in the right places in the right spaces. And that seems like the beginning. After you do that, what do you learn from that? How do you go along and analyze? And, and how do you project from there? And I guess I would like to know what you bigger organizations do and how you do that and how that can be of service to the rest of the agency and to the board. And I think that goes back to a number of things that have said, but but it's too easy to focus on, on this part and not, now what do we learn? The interpretive side is kind mm -hmm. of what I see is, yeah, you can put the financial statement package together, you can do all the right things, you can even put it in an executive summary and it's clear as anything, but depending on the audience, how it's conveyed and received, I think, is critical. Uh, Jim Janetsky, Everest Academy in Clarkston. We're a pre-K through 12 school. Just started high school four years ago, so we are our first seniors this year. Um, uh, been there about two and a half years before that. I worked for Cranbrook for 10 years. So Bob and I have worked together on a couple things. Um, I don't know. Everyone's got lots of good ideas, so I'm not going to really add to it from there. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Trafton Jean, for for Music Hall Center. For the performing arts in Detroit. Um, basically, I think this is a great idea. Um, I don't, I guess working for a performing arts center, I don't really get to interact with a lot of financial minded people on a daily basis. So I think this is going to be a good opportunity to maybe learn new ideas, new approaches, new ways of doing things, kind of sharing best practices, and um, looking forward to coming back. Thanks for being here. Hi, I'm Patty. Um, I'm with, this is a mouthful, the School Community Health Alliance of Michigan. Uh, we're a statewide membership organization that does technical assistance for all the school-based and schooling health centers uh, in the state of Michigan. Um, obviously, our concentration is in the metro Detroit area. Uh, centers uh, Henry Ford, St. John, Health Systems. Um, they sponsor a lot of our school-based and schooling health centers. Um, I like all the ideas in the room. I'm glad I'm here. Uh, a lot of the same issues for me. Uh, we are founding, we were started um, as part of a national pilot project by the Kellogg Foundation six years ago. Uh, our founding director resigned last year with the ending of our funding from Kellogg. So we are in huge transition. Um, revenue streams, looking out there for anything we can find. Uh, we're state funded, foundation funded, fundraising funded. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Helen Rorty with a very tiny little crisis pregnancy center. Uh, we are located in Detroit, east side of Detroit. Uh, we do belong to a coalition, the Southeastern Michigan Coalition of Pregnancy Centers. We're totally nonprofit. I mean, we have totally all of us rely totally on donations. So we are experiencing big problems now financially. Uh, but our, uh, we've been in existence for 37 years, the Park Center. And uh, however, everything was very stagnant. I mean, we had old board members that were there 37 years ago. So, and like you said earlier about, uh, you know, they, that ba that was their baby, we walked to them. So what we did is we, had, we took the uh, boardwalk uh, sessions so that got us motivated and started. We're totally revamping our board members, uh, expectations of them, 
Uh, I'm not uh, the financial person. She wasn't able to come today. But uh, just there was just so much here, so many valuable ideas and everything that uh, I will share all this with her. And, uh, you know, I, we have just grown so much from those boardwalk. Uh, that is uh, really quick and long. So. Excellent. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mary Ann Dwyer, I'm the Director of Business Operations for Haven. Um, I had already jotted down a lot of these ideas. Another one is um, uh, the charity um, rating sites like GuideStar, Charity Navigator. Does mm -hmm. anyone take a Bible? What are their merits, pros, cons, mm -hmm. things? That kind of comes and goes with us, like we really focus on it and it goes away and then it rears up mm -hmm. again. So if there's any value. Good. Yeah. Uh, I'm Emily Schwab, controller for Builders Club um, in Royal Oak, and pretty much everything. But um, we have had just in the last few years the big shakeup with Gilda's Club, where the Michael Radner left um, due to political reasons, and so we've had to completely reorganize the whole structure and the fundraising, um, the revenue streams and downscale things um, quite a bit. But things are pretty viable and when we, same thing, renewed the whole board, the board's renewed. Um, and we're still in the process of working through that and, and trying to find different revenue streams. Um, but overall, things have, have worked out better <coughs> for the organization. But yeah, it, it's tough going through all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that some of these themes three or four years ago wouldn't have really bubbled up as significant um, if we would have pulled the group then. Um, so it's interesting to me to hear some of the, the consistent themes that you know are, are coming through from all of you. So I'll try to capture all that and send it out. Hi everyone, my name is Julie Funky. I am Director of Finance and Administration at State Voices. We are uh, based in Detroit. We're a national network of other nonprofits that work in civic engagement, um, get out the vote efforts. We provide uh, tools, voter identification tools for those nonprofits. So we support about 650 nonprofits through those tools, um, again, across 17 states. We're busy. And we are in a um, huge kind of growth area right now. So a lot of the um, uh, topics that were already mentioned were really, really great. Um, so I, I jotted down a couple things, but I think they've all been covered. But I did want to mention real quick, I talked to Heather about the um, benefits survey, and I'm going to help her because I do all the HR at the organization as well. We're going to send out a survey monkey instead of the Excel sheet, just so we can analyze data a little bit easier. Um, and so if you have any ideas for questions, if you just email them to Heather, we're going to get together and then put together that uh, the survey and then be able to analyze data and send it out to everybody. So just a uh, hands up on that. I know. I do. Yay, Thank you. benefits. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited to have a group of people right here. <laughs> so, yeah. Bob Blumenfeld with Orchard Children's Services, and I'll just add a couple of things. Um, I also serve on the board of the Human Services Association Workers' Comp Fund. So, folks who aren't members of that but would like to explore alternatives for. Uh, workers' compensation coverage. Um, I encourage you to look at our website, hsawcf.org. Um, I also sit on the board of Rebuilding Together Detroit, and we just did a home rehab on the east side, so I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, and I sit on the board of the Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy in Superior Township, and Bob and I have been working closely together in that endeavor. And thanks for, for all your feedback today. Excellent. Dick Russell, president of the Friends of Highland Recreation Area. We're a nonprofit 501c3 rebuilding the Edsel and Eleanor Haven Hill complex of buildings built in 1924. The main lodge was arsoned in 99. Uh, Bob's been out to see the facilities that we have. I'm thrilled to say that we've had two asbestos abatements in one year. <laughs> uh, we also, believe it or not, I appreciate the network that comes from this meeting. Barbara Flagel came across to me February last year, said, you're uh, in need of an architect. Here's my husband's car. He used to be an instructor here in architecture. And through his support and uh, resources to another pro bono architect, we've been waiting seven months for drawings. In one month, Tom fired him up. Got drawings on Wednesday at our board meeting, reviewed the building permit application, 
changed it on Thursday, got a $200 check from the treasurer, went to Okemos, filed that application, and one of our vice presidents said, we've been here before, let's make sure it's right. A half an hour later, we walked out with a building permit that would have taken two weeks. What I'm really praising is the network stuff that comes from across the room, across the avenue of nonprofits, and I really appreciate the fact that I've come through the nonprofit certificate program here at Lawrence Tech, and Dr. Linda continues, <laughs> still continues to keep the alum alumni informed about what's going on so we can come back and help Thank the case. Thank you, George, having the program. Yes. I have one quick. We're looking at expanding to add a business finance type position. Would anybody be willing to share their job descriptions? Sure. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, we can do it any number of ways, but I will send a blast out to everybody um, as long as I have the correct information on the sheet out front. Um, just saying, you know, kind of recapping, throwing out some ideas as it evolves to the next session, and you can use that as a way to communicate as well. So as we, as we talked about, Jerry. Sure. Um, thank you. We're wrapping this thing up. It has been really exciting. I've really learned a lot today from all you folks, as I always do. So it's really, and it's really great to hear the energy and the conversation. I need some feedback. Um, uh, not on your evaluation forms, but in particular, I'd like you to, if you could write down on the evaluation form, what form of social media do you think we could use most effectively in this group? How many are Facebook users? Ah, good. Facebook? Sound good? I mean, that's LinkedIn. 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 LinkedIn for business. Yeah. Facebook for my friend's family. Yeah. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So it's LinkedIn. And yeah. we have that. Okay. Oh, okay. good. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I want to know. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you at the quarterly. Uh, get the yeah, we're, I'll send out a note with a tentative date. I'm thinking, as long as we can get a room and it makes sense for everybody, like, uh, I think it's January 25th. Fifth, I think it's the fourth Wednesday in January, but uh, I'll confirm that once I'm able to do so. But uh, we're looking at that as our next day, and we'll have it. The sessions themselves will be. I'm not sure exactly how to structure. Uh, we tend to keep them smaller, so we may break up into two parts or something, um, just to keep it as a kind of a good, free flowing dialogue um, and conversational. But this is great. Thank you guys. Really appreciate you being here. Have a great day.